You know, when you become a child of God, God saves you and He saves you forever. There's certain things you can't undo. You can't undo being born and becoming a child of God. Uh, but your walk with God, uh, you have a responsibility with it. You don't become suddenly become a spiritual robot where God directs everything you say and do. God will work in your heart and life powerfully, but we still have to respond. And, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Colossians in chapter 1. <clears throat> Now, the, uh, the Apostle Paul is, <clears throat> is always praying for the people that he led to Christ and the churches he established. And in verse 9, he begins to talk to them about prayer uh, and what he's praying for, you know. And um, <clears throat> we, we really need to learn from his prayers. But I'm going to read... Uh, from uh, verse 9 all the way to verse 18. So you follow along in your Bible and I'll read. For this reason, verse 9 says, We also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he, Christ, may have the preeminence. And so in this, what is Paul praying for? Well, he's praying for our eyes to be under, of our spirits to be open. The eyes of our understanding to, to be enlightened so we can know this love that God has for us and that it would be reflected in how we live. It, uh, one of the passages here in this, this um, one of the verses in this passage I want to point out to you is verse 13. This is what God has done. He has delivered us from the power. And the word power there speaks of authority, of darkness. And he has conveyed us, he has transferred, translated us into the kingdom of or under the authority of the Son of His love, Jesus Christ. So there's been a transfer here. There's been a transfer from the authority of Satan as lost sinners, the God of this age rules mankind. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And when we seek to govern our own lives, we take ourselves out from under the, the provision and the protection of God and we set ourselves under the authority of the prince of darkness. And uh, remember last week we looked at a passage where there were some people who thought God was their father but Jesus said, you, <laughs> you guys are children of the devil. That's basically what he told them. The devil is your father and it's uh, obvious by what you're practicing and how you're behaving yourself. And so, God, when we trust Jesus Christ to be our Savior, He removes us from Satan's kingdom and He places us in the God's kingdom, the kingdom of His dear Son. 
In fact, in this he points out that we go into a deep relationship where we're not just subjects under a king, but we are members of the body connected to a head. That's how closely related we are to God, the oneness that we have in Christ Jesus. But how did this transfer take place? Well, in the... Um, in the book of Exodus, we find that the children of Israel were in slavery. Uh, Egypt ran on slavery. We, we find in the New Testament the authority of Rome. Rome ran on slavery. And um, so many people were captured and sold into slavery, and they were traded like so much property. And uh, how did... in, in in the Old Testament under the law, an Israelite who got into uh, financial trouble, okay, he could put himself under bondage to someone for a period of seven years. And, uh, and so there was slavery that took place, if you would, in the nation of Israel. And uh, after that, they were set free. But um, there were, the people understood slavery. The Bible says that, that mankind basically are slaves to sin. And Satan uses that. But Jesus Christ came and identified with us. The story of Ruth uh, fleshes this out. Uh, the, the idea of the kinsman redeemer. That someone who got into trouble and they were in slavery, they were in bondage. That the kinsman redeemer, the one who was closely related and who chose free of by his own will to intervene on the behalf of his relative and was able, had enough money to pay the debt that this relative owed. This kinsman redeemer could purchase this relative and the relative's property out of bondage. And this is a picture of what Jesus Christ has done for us. He is our near kinsman. He didn't take on the form of an angel. He took on the seed of Abraham. He became a human being. Uh, flesh and blood and he walked this earth and willingly no man forced him he chose to go and fulfill the will of the father by going to the cross and becoming sin for us and because he was perfect and righteous he was able to pay the debt that we owed and so that is pointed out to us in verse 14 of Colossians 1 in whom in Christ we have redemption we have been purchased the price for our freedom has been paid so that we could be set free. Authority of Satan, we were redeemed and we're put under the authority and the power of Christ Jesus. Redemption through his blood, his life was given, his blood was shed, and we experienced the forgiveness of our sins. Turn to Titus, if you would. Titus chapter 2. Talking about uh, verse 13. Looking. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Looking. Oh, I read this for the elders this morning. Let's just read 11 through uh, 14, okay? For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And that will make you stand out like a sore thumb. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Because he's coming back, he said he would, and that's the blessed hope. What did Jesus do? Verse 14, look at this. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous of good works. So this again brings out that point. We were redeemed. We were purchased out of the darkness, out of the power of Satan, out of sin. He's removed us by his blood and he says, now you are mine. So we are redeemed from something to something. We're saved from something to something. This is what God has done for you and for me. And uh, 
I like the uh, King James because it, it uses the word peculiar. And I think that's really more descriptive of some of us, isn't it? Um, that he might uh, redeem for himself his own peculiar, special people, zealous for good works. Now that is the description of what Christ has done and what it, what it should look like in your life and my life. I have been set free from the slave market of sin. Now I'm free to love God, to serve God, to honor God, to glorify God, to walk with God. I'm not free to go back into the slop. I'm set free to honor Him. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter says something so similar. 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, we'll, we'll start at verse 13 and uh, read through verse 19, okay? The challenge, gird up the loins of your mind. I won't go into the, what that illustrates, but uh, it, it means get serious about this. And uh, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conform yourselves to the former lust, lost, lustful, obedient, cheerful. The contrast. As in your ignorance. But as he called you is holy, so also... You also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. When God spoke to the children of Israel, to the Levitical priesthood, when he, when he, he put this on them, he said, You guys be holy. You know what well, we understand that? You be distinctive. You be different. You're, you're from something, from slavery. Now you're in freedom. You're my nation. Okay? I, I brought you out from that authority to mine. And it ought to make a difference, make a huge difference. And so, be holy. Holy, different. Christians, we're not supposed to try to be just like the world. The world is supposed to see what it's like to walk with God through us. Verse 17 says, And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout... The time of your stay here, it's temporary, isn't it? In fear, or reverence, respect the Father, knowing that you were not redeemed, you were not purchased with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. As Peter writes to these folks, he says, look, you've been redeemed, and it wasn't Gold. It wasn't silver. It wasn't temporary corruptible things that purchased you out of this old life into the new relationship with God. This is what he said, verse 19. You were purchased with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. I've said this before because this is the way I think. God paid too much for you. Paid too much for me. And you're talking about getting his money's worth. He didn't. But it wasn't, that wasn't the measurement that God was deciding upon. I'm going to give my son because I'm going to get so many hours of obedience out of you. And I'm going to get so many days and years of obedience out of you. That's not what motivated him to give his son for you. It was his love for you that motivated him. He loved you and what he saw what you needed. And he said, I want to redeem them. I want to set them free. I want to give them an opportunity to know me. That's what God was motivated by. It's an unconditional love. That love that God has for us is not based upon us. It's on Him. Knowing what we need most. That's what motivates Him. And He was willing to pay the price. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians in chapter 6. This is a, this is a church... 
that needs uh, a whooping. I mean, they, they are, they are uh, you know, you look at who they are, where they lived, you know, you, you, I guess we can kind of understand. Thankfully, God is patient, right? I mean, because I mean, it's easy to understand why he loves us. We're so good. But the Corinthians, <laughs> I'm joking, you know that. The Corinthian people, like, they were in a sinful, corrupt, pagan city. And they come, and Paul comes, this Jewish rabbi comes in and starts teaching them about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit bears witness with some of them that this is the truth. And, uh, and they respond and they, they start a church, a church in this wicked place. And they, they, these people are from generations of this kind of lifestyle and this belief. And they've been taken out of the authority of Satan and put under the, into the kingdom of God's dear son. And they're surrounded by the enemy. I mean, it's just everywhere. It's, and some of them struggle. They struggle with it. Well, we're, we don't need to read the whole thing, but this whole chapter is, uh, is talking about specific sins that were common and plentiful in that area. Okay, they were... The, the immorality that took place in Corinth, um, it was used to describe people who were immoral all over the Roman world. It, if it was called Corinthian, it wasn't talking about leather or, or sculpture or buildings. It was talking about lifestyle. And so somebody who was uh, lustful and, and debauched, they were Corinthians. <laughs> And this is where this church was planted in. And this is what these people were living in. And so Paul doesn't say, okay, you Corinthian believers who have fallen into sin, you need to get saved again. That's impossible. They didn't. They could not get saved again. They need to get right. They need to believe and understand who they were. And, uh, and so he teaches them about that. In verse 19, he says this, Do you not know? You see, there was some ignorance in their life that led to bad practice. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Now, that's a novel idea. Christian, you are not your own. Now, now, I can stand in front of the mirror and say this, and then I start thinking about my life. I say, how much of my life do I act like it is absolutely mine? Well, uh, I'll just say too much. Okay? Too much of my life is lived like it's mine. But when I think my life is mine, I am in error. It's not mine. It's no longer, and never really was in practice mine, but as a Christian, when I act like it's my life, I'll live it my way, I'll do what I want to do, well then I am denying this truth this reality of redemption. Verse 20. Why are you not your own? It says, you were bought at a price. Of course. Isn't that silly? That sounds redundant to us, doesn't it? You were bought at a price. Well, this is a phrase <laughs> that, that, that points to the fact that the price was extravagant. It was amazing. It was much. Okay? You were bought at a price. If you were bought, you were something was paid for you, right? But bought at a price refers to the fact that the price that was paid was just great. So you were bought at a price. What was that price? It was the blood of God's own Son. It was the death of Jesus in your place. That was what price that was the price that was paid for you and for me 
So God, you were his in the sense that he created you, right? It's like every, everything belongs to God. But, but see how God has worked? Here we are under the authority of Satan running around helter-skelter selfishly and in rebellion to God. And God says, I'm paying a price for you. Now you're twice mine. You're mine because I made you. You were created for me, he said. That's what God said. You were created for him. But then he loved you so much that he purchased you. He paid to set you free from the slave market of sin, from the power of, of Satan, from death. You were bought at a price. What's the result? Well, I'm not my own. I was bought with a price. Therefore, what's the therefore? Therefore, it's what went before, isn't it? Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, which belong to God. So, what should be the result of me embracing this truth that I am not mine, I am His? That my life is to, in every way, glorify God. Now, let's, let's just make it personal here. You know, uh, you, you remember after the resurrection, Jesus is making it personal with Peter, feed my sheep. And what's Peter? He's, he sees John and he's been under the pressure cooker here. Jesus is grilling him a little bit, you know. You denied me three times. We're going to get back on track together. You know, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And, uh, and so, like we like to do sometimes, it goes all the way back to Adam. Peter looks at John and says, but what about him? You know, when, when, when we talk of, of, from the scriptures, and we, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Do you ever think about somebody else? You don't have to tell me, you know. Boy, I wish so-and-so was here. They needed to hear that. <laughs> That's how we are. Man, did you record that? i got to give that to so-and-so. They need to hear that. But that's okay, but start with you. You see, this is where we need to be. You know, I've told you, I, when I'm preaching, I'm preaching to me. All right, if you get anything from it, praise the Lord. Um, you were bought at a price. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God. So if I am going to glorify God, I just I need to find, Lord, how can I love you? How can I know you better? How can I serve you? What are the opportunities? What field have you planted me into? What are the needs around me? I need to be seeing this is how I can glorify God because... He wants to live. Jesus wants to live his life through me. It's his. And so how can I, how can I, what have you given me to do? And we can start tr trying to figure out that for other people. Don't do that. At least not until you've done it for yourself. How can I glorify God? You know, it, it can look a bit different for every one of us. You're not supposed to put somebody else in the mold you think it's supposed to be. This is what I think glorifying God is supposed to look like for you. The Holy Spirit is going to do that if, if we'll let him. And he might use this sometimes to encourage or to prompt somebody. But that's not our job is to fix people. We need to embrace what God has for us first. And, and, uh, and what am I doing can, can I glorify God? Is God being honored in this and that? You know, God doesn't want all you to quit your jobs and go in the mission field somewhere. You understand that, right? Some of you might, he might want you to go in the mission field. But he doesn't want us all to do that. God's given you people. He's given you responsibilities. He's given you a ministry. And we, we need to receive that from the Lord. And when we do that by the grace of God, to the glory of God, and God is made known in this world around us. While we're here, look in um, chapter 7, verse 23. 
1 Corinthians 7.23. Just just notice that. You were bought with a price. You were bought at a price. And then the admonition here. Do not become slaves of men. Who is my boss? Who is my Lord? Who is my head? Who is the king? It's the Lord Jesus. Okay. Guys, it's not your wife. Wives, it's not your husband. Folks, it's not your boss. It's Jesus. Now, under, in, under his authority, we might be under somebody else's authority. And we can honor him in that way. But it's Jesus that we need to recognize. And we need to serve and make choices and decisions out of obedience to Christ. That's what we're here for. I don't know what Jesus wants me to do. Read the book. Read the book. One more passage, Romans 14. And we'll close with this. Unless I get a new inspiration before I get done. <laughs> no, Romans 14. Look at verse 6. It's kind of a distinction among people. And Paul's saying, you know, don't be so concerned about other people here. Understand that s- some people are called to serve Jesus differently than you are. God gave them different gifts and understanding. So it says, um, well, verse 5, one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. He observes the day, observes it to the Lord, and he observes not the day. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. I don't ever talk that way. But anyway, um, he who eats... Eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. You see, it's, there, there, there is some diversity here that God is built into the system. Okay? But it's not sinful. It, it, it's based upon what God has revealed to us. Okay? And, and our conscience needs to be settled in that. This is what God has said. Verse 7. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to Christ. In this life or the next one. For to this end, Christ died and rose again, rose and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. Jesus is my Lord. He has purchased me. I belong to him. I am not here to live for me. You, Christian, are not here to live for you. And, uh, and Jesus wants you happy. Not maybe in the sense of the world. But he said things like, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Give you some nugget of truth there. He said, I want you to be happy and this is how you find it. Not the way the world says it. Not the way your own reasoning says it. But if you'll give... If you'll sacrifice, if you'll love, you'll find a joy that the world doesn't know anything about. If you let Christ direct your life, if you let him be the head of the body, then you will find under under that authority the most freedom that is possible for us to know in this life. Amen.